Hi, um, welcome to the Irish Skin Foundation Tackling Scalp Psoriasis. So I'm sure many of you are aware that tomorrow is World Psoriasis Day. So the Irish Skin Foundation, which is a charity that provides support for people living with various skin conditions, wanted to take this opportunity to discuss scalp psoriasis. Scalp is a very common site for psoriasis, but is often not given the same attention as psoriasis on the other parts of the body. The impact that scalp psoriasis can have on the quality of life is often not acknowledged. And that is why we decided to do this for this, this subject for this webinar. So tonight, I'm delighted to say that I am going to be joined by Caroline Irwin and Zoe Ryan, who are both patient advocates. Caroline has been living with psoriasis since she was a young child. And she has also worked with the Irish Skin Foundation for many years, providing very valuable peer support to other people living with psoriasis. Zoe Ryan is an awfully born radio and TV broadcaster and founder of the Itching to Tell You Psoriasis platform. She increases the awareness of psoriasis and by doing this, hopefully will break down the stigma that's involved with this visible condition. So I'm looking forward to sharing their experiences after the short presentation. So just a few housekeeping uh, rules first. You are on listen only mode. So even if you talk, we will not be able to hear you. The webinar will be recorded and sent to attendees in the next few days. There will be a survey at the end of the webinar. So please take a few minutes to fill out the survey as it will help inform content for future webinars. The link will appear in your browser when you exit the webinar. Post questions relevant to the topic and we'll select a few at the end of the webinar. And for specific condition, for specific questions on your skin condition, you can also contact our Ask a Nurse helpline after the webinar. So the con our Ask a Nurse helpline is a unique service operated by dermatology nurse specialists. We have nurses who specialize in general and pediatric dermatology. It is a callback service. So you submit your question either by phone or the website form, and we arrange a callback appointment. You can submit your question to at irishskin.ie forward slash ask our dermatology nurse. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our Ask a Nurse Helpline sponsors. Without the sponsorship of these companies, we would not be able to continue this wonderful service. <clears throat> so this evening, we're going to discuss scalp psoriasis, challenges and treatment options. I work as an advanced nurse practitioner in a busy dermatology hospital, and I'm dealing with patients the whole time and then I work on the helpline with the Irish Skin Foundation. And again, we would get frequent calls about psoriasis and scalp psoriasis. So I hope between myself, Caroline and Zoe, we'll be able to share some tips that will help you this evening. So psoriasis can affect any part of the body, including the nails and the scalp. The scalp is a common site for psoriasis. Believe it or not, up to 80% of people living with psoriasis have some degree of scalp psoriasis. It may range from very mild scale in the scalp, which people often just say, I've got dandruff, not realizing it may be linked to the psoriasis, or the condition may be more severe with thick, hard scale and visible psoriasis down on the forehead and behind the ears. Symptoms vary from patient to patient. Everyone with scalp psoriasis will have some degree of scaling. It may be, as I said a moment ago, just like dusty light scale, or else it may be severe, thick, um, hard scale. Some people experience itch, 
most people will have some degree of dryness. People often say that their scalp is burning or stinging, they may get bleeding, and in severe cases, they'll sometimes describe it as like having a, a tight helmet on the scalp. In severe cases of scalp psoriasis, some people will get temporary hair loss, and I'd like to stress temporary. It's normally when the hair follicle is blocked by the thick scale that the hair just isn't growing. So it is important, and we'll talk about that in a moment, about descaling the scalp. So the challenges for people dealing with scalp psoriasis, and Zoe and Caroline will be able to talk about this firsthand, is the visibility, the embarrassment of some of, that some people experience, particularly in you know, various social situations, the cosmetic appearance of the psoriasis, and the treatment difficulty, you know, the presence of hair makes the skin less accessible for application of treatments. Phototherapy, which is great for the body psoriasis, is not very effective for scalp psoriasis because the UV is blocked by the hair. So sometimes in the clinic setting, men may choose to shave the head to treat the scalp psoriasis because they're fed up of applying the creams and lotions. But for women, that's just not an option. So various treatments range from shampoos to topical treatments and then systemic treatments in other cases of psoriasis. So shampoos contain tar, they contain descaling agents, which we refer to as keratolytic agents. These are things like salicylic acid, which are commonly found in psoriasis shampoos. There are shampoos as well that may contain steroid. Each of these shampoos, there will be instructions with them. Your healthcare professional or your pharmacist will give you advice on how long to leave your shampoo on. And that is an important aspect of the treatment. If you don't leave your shampoo on for a period of time, you know, for the tar shampoo, we say usually around eight minutes. There is a steroid shampoo that we say 20 minutes. So for these active ingredients to work, they need that time. If you don't give them the time, you may as well be using whatever's in the shower, whether it's, you know, Johnson's baby or Pantene, because the ingredients, unless left, will not work. Topical preparations, then, these come in the form of ointments, creams, gels, uh, liquids, mousses, and a lot of the ingredients are similar to the shampoo. Some of them are higher concentrations. The vitamin D analogue is different from the steroid. Patients would often have heard of Davinex or Davabet, and this is the group of the vitamin D analogues. Emollients are moisturizers, and these help to soften the scale, help it to lift more easily, and counteract the dryness and the stinging and burning of the scalp. So there are treatment problems, and one of the biggest issues that I find in clinic is compliance is frequently low, life is busy, people don't leave their uh, products on the scalp for long enough or else they don't like them because they're smelly. You know, tar does smell, maybe they don't like the smell, maybe the family is complaining about the smell. The treatments are messy as well, it makes the hair greasy. If you're sleeping in it overnight, it may make your pillows greasy. Um, you know, the treatments are time consuming. If you're treating your whole scalp, with something like tar, it could take you 35 or 40 minutes. And it is difficult to apply because you have to parse the hair so that the treatment gets onto the scalp and it isn't sitting on the hair. So one of the most important steps is to descale. 
if you leave the scale on your scalp, your other treatments will not penetrate. So some people do scale with an emollient like coconut oil. Some people are happy to use the tar. And then once you've descaled, you're then ready to treat the psoriasis and the inflammation. And this is done with the prescribed treatment, whether it's the vitamin D analog or whether it's your steroid. Unfortunately, there isn't a cure for scalp psoriasis. So after you've got the scalp under control, you're then into maintenance. So this information here and uh, the infographics, these are available in the psoriasis booklet and Ola will put up uh, the link in the chat box later. And it tells you how to descale the scalp. You part the hair at one centimeter intervals. Ideally, if you've got somebody to assist you, that's great, but that's not possible for everybody. So sit in front of the mirror and then you'll be able to see your parting, part along the hair, put your um, tar or your emollient on, maybe coconut oil. And you have to do one parting here, then a centimetre away from that and a centimetre away and a centimetre away. So it is time consuming to get the whole scalp done. Ideally leave it on overnight. When you're ready to descale, then what you need to do is get a fine uh, comb or a comb with the teeth close together. And you move the comb in an upward direction in the opposite direction of the hair fall. And just gently in a, a almost like a seesaw um, motion, just descale the scalp. This motion loosens the scale and then you need to shampoo the hair to remove the loose scale. Now, because you've applied grease, whether it's cocoa, whether it's coconut oil, almond oil, whatever the oil you want to, um, to use, you need to put your shampoo onto, a, onto the hair before you wet it, because then the shampoo will grab onto the oil, sorry, and onto the grease, and it will lift out more easily. So massage the shampoo into the dry hair and then wet the hair, work up a lather, rinse the hair and repeat the process. Once you've descaled the scalp, then your active treatment will be uh, much more effective. So apply your prescribed uh, steroid or your vitamin D analog and these will treat the inflammation. As I said earlier, maintenance is the final step. And that will be, you know, using your shampoo maybe once or twice a week, maybe doing your uh, emollient or your tar in overnight once a week or once a fortnight or however often you need to do it to keep things under control. Other treatments are systemic uh, treatments. And if you have a psori extensive psoriasis with scalp involvement, these may be prescribed by your dermatologist. And these are in the form of tablets or injections. So that is um, the uh, short presentation. Now I'd like to... Um, open the discussion with Caroline and Zoe. And if you don't mind, Caroline, I might start with you. Um, I know you've had a long journey with psoriasis and you've been through the creams and the lotions and the tablets and you're now uh, on injections. And through that journey, have you picked up any tips that you could share or is, you know, have you made adaptions with your life, with your lifestyle or hair because of your psoriasis? I don't know whether you 
grew a fringe to hide psoriasis on your forehead at any stage or is there anything that you could share with us about your your experiences yeah i would have my first um, sign of psoriasis was on my scalp at nine years of age and it was thick black very very aggressive at the start and it spread down into my forehead so i did grow a fringe straight away that was one of my first things um it would have gotten worse over the years i wish i knew all the things that you're telling us now back then <laughs> um i tried to put stuff on my hair without getting rid of the scaling and things like that so definitely what you're saying is true to really and i get a lot of calls from people saying oh the shampoo isn't working or the lotion isn't working but they're obviously trying to put it on thick crusty scale which doesn't absorb properly as you, as you said yourself yeah i suppose um i I had to I had very long hair, first of all, as a child and cut it up shorter um, to make it more manageable. And it certainly followed the hairline around and down into my forehead. So I did wear I still wear a fringe, but I don't I'm, I'm now delighted I can put my hair behind my ears, which is something I never did either. Um, so I suppose I just tried to cover it up. But certainly it's, it's treatable, but it is time consuming, but it's worth it because I never wore dark clothes ever because like that, the odd time you did you'd have flakes all over your shoulders, people would be brushing it off and that sort of thing. So I wore lighter colored clothes um, for a long time, but in, in latter years I did buy dark jackets and things like that, which was great. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's a hard one to treat, um, and especially in men with their hair being so short and it's much more visible than for women. We can mask it a bit better. I did lose some bits of hair over the years from picking at it and pulling out hair and things like that, but that has sort of settled down uh, with the treatments I have now. Oh, thanks, Caroline. And what amazes me, it's funny, Caroline, that you say that you cut your hair up short. What amazes me with Zoe is she has such fantastic long hair. <laughs> and maybe, Zoe, you can tell us how you can manage that long hair and treat your scalp um, because it is... I'm sure quite difficult at times to to treat the scalp with the long hair or what tips have you got that you can share with us? Well, it really is a blessing and a curse, Carmel, in a way, because as Caroline was saying, like, you know, it, it's easy to have the long hair because it covers a lot. My scalp psoriasis still is and always was very predominantly at the back of my head, across the nape of my neck and down the back of my ears. And for years, I wouldn't dare wear my hair up. I always had it down. Now, there was times in my life where I did experience some hair loss due to both, you know, as you said earlier on, the scalp being very quite thick at some parts where my hair just got thinner in those areas or couldn't grow through it all. And also from missing use of strong steroids as well I experienced some balding and hair loss so the long hair really came in handy then because I was able to style my hair in a way that it covered it I'm sure as everyone can see I kind of have this very extreme comb over thing going on for years and it's nearly like a shield to me that it it can hide the scalp psoriasis that's predominantly around the scalp but I found it interesting there that Caroline said about you know that over the years she would have actually bought the dark jackets and you know i found out a couple of tips and tricks over the years that have helped me that do you know the lint rollers that you can get for you know taking fluff off jackets and coats um i use those to to get the the kind of flakes off because I love black clothes so much and that's one thing I've never been able to give up is the black clothes but you don't even have to scrape at your scalp you're sitting there and it just falls everywhere so I find you can get these little mini ones and um, they come in all different types of little euro saver shops even the likes of Lidl and Aldi you can get them in sometimes pennies that they'll fit in your handbag and I just have them everywhere and if you're on Dublin bus and you've got this layer of snow on top of your shoulder just gently rub it on the top and it'll take it off but in regards to the long hair again Carmel um you were saying there about the emollient therapy and it is extremely time consuming when you have hair this long because the parsing just goes on for hours but thankfully you know you don't have to use the thick oily emollients anymore I personally like using the thick oily emollients you know at least once in the treatment kind of 
schedule that I'd have um, to get that thick layer off. But the likes of Real Life and Subam, as you mentioned earlier, they have created foams and there's other companies that they've created aerosols, which are a lot less time consuming to apply to the scalp. So if it is a case of it doesn't fit in with someone's lifestyle to sit down and you have hours at your disposal every couple of days to be applying your emollients, leaving them in overnight and then scraping them out the next day. They're good alternatives that you might have to use the thicker ones, we'll say once a week and then use those in between. So there are those options out there now that there's been advances in products, thankfully. Yeah, that's great, Zoe. Um, the, the mousses are more cosmetically acceptable. The patients that use them find that the hair isn't as greasy and the companies have put active ingredients in them as well, like the urea, which will help to moisturize the scalp and the stronger preparations then, the higher the concentration of urea also helps to descale the scalp. So yeah, that, that's a great tip, the, um, the mousse. And um, just when you said, Zoe, about, you know, being on the bus, I'm sure at times, I know I've come across patients that would be maybe at a meeting and they're conscious that someone is sitting behind, particularly the men, you know, the, with the short hair and they're worried about the psoriasis behind their ears. Um, like there are things that people do find embarrassing, whether it is going to the hairdressers, whether it's, it's, you know, worrying about sitting on the bus and somebody behind you or sitting in a meeting. Like, how do you cope with those sort of things? Or how do you cope when somebody says, oh, what's that? Yeah, I mean, for years, I really was very, you know, conscious of the psoriasis, you know, I'm still obviously aware of it, but for a long time, I did my best to hide it and conceal it and all oh, the embarrassment, you know, there was always this constant fear that if someone saw it, you know, or if someone asked you about it, you were terrified. And I think that that fear and embarrassment stems from the fact that people with psoriasis were very aware that there's a lack of understanding and awareness about it, which means that when people see it, they don't understand it. They don't know what it is. And as humans, we fear the unknown. So for me, getting on the likes of public transport or going to the gym with my hair tied up and fearing someone standing behind me and seeing it, the fear was because I thought they're going to see this because psoriasis isn't in mainstream media as much as it should. They don't recognize psoriasis. So they see these often unsightly scales or God forbid red raw scales that could sometimes be bleeding and they don't know what it is so they fear it and you know I, I dreaded the thought of someone maybe seeing it and taking a step back or recoiling away from me because they were afraid to come near me because they feared it was contagious or something like that purely because of the ignorance of not knowing what it is on no fault of their own it's just the way society is that's not spoken about enough so in regards to how you deal with that it's very much is it it has to start with you it's once you start seeing your psoriasis in a different way you'll start accepting it more and it's taken me a very long time to get to that part you know as I said I hit it I, I really I didn't want anyone to ask me questions about it but I started to realize that by me not talking about it and preventing people from asking questions about it that means that the problem is still ongoing. That's doing no one any help. There's no more information being circulated. So now when someone asks me a question, instead of me being all embarrassed and you know ashamed of it, I nearly welcome the question because I see that as an opportunity to spread awareness about psoriasis and educate another person on it. Because if we got to a stage where someone recognizes psoriasis, they're just going to say, oh, that's just psoriasis. The same way that we see, you know, skin conditions that are quite commonly recognized, like the likes of acne or something. Back in the day, people might have thought if someone had acne, it meant they were dirty in some way. Whereas now you see someone with acne and we understand it. We know the, what acne looks like. So my advice to anybody is that it's trying to embrace your own skin. You know, for a long time, I struggled with the belief and to understand that my condition was lifelong and it was something that I would have to live with for the rest of my life and all I wanted to do was get rid of it hide it until I could get rid of it and you know it took a long time but throughout my journey with psoriasis 
I've accepted now that this is something that I have to live with. And I said to myself, instead of fighting with my psoriasis, willing it to go away the whole time, I have to learn to work with it and coexist together and have a happy existence. So I really found that going online and finding the psoriasis community online, they're such a welcoming community and very embracing of their skin. They really empowered me to view my skin in a different way, because at the end of the day, your skin isn't going anywhere. You know, you will have these plaques you know, probably for the rest of your life, unless you go on some sort of treatment like a biologic that maybe gets rid of the visual signs of it. But realistically, you're always going to have the condition. So the sooner that you start to accept your visual appearance, the way you look and to not see it as a problem, to see it as just part of you. I mean, some people online, even the likes of artists and photographers, they photograph and they, they show psoriasis in a way that they make it art. They make it look beautiful. And it was from constantly exposing myself to that community online and seeing people so bravely bearing the, sca the scales and talking about it so openly and viewing it as this distinguishable part of them that made them beautiful, changed the way that I viewed my psoriasis. So that's my advice that I would give to someone who's really struggling with their self-confidence and feeling like they can't show the world how they look. We need to stop hiding. We need to start showing people our scales, start wearing clothes that shows it. When people ask a question, answering them honestly, explaining it to them in a way that they'll understand and let them know that's nothing to be afraid of because it's from that that psoriasis will become less stigmatized and that we'll just be able to walk around and not have that embarrassment. Yeah, I think I think the contagious element is a big factor. You know, once once people see something on the skin, they're worried that they will get it and that it's contagious. And Caroline, can I just ask you? As I think you were eight, were you when you got psoriasis? Nine. Nine. How how did a nine year old cope when people said? what's that or I didn't how... know what to tell them I had no information right I agree with Zoe I, I denied hmm. and covered it up for 30 years and right I kept fighting it why is it me why do I have it and then I got up one day and I thought you know listen here I started reading more about it there was no internet and no information no booklets and I just covered it up for years and years didn't treat it properly didn't put on the creams I was given right not given information and my advice would be get yourself educated, <clears throat> not particularly on Dr. Google, but go to good reputable websites, find out about it. There is no cure, as Zoe said, yet it will be there. Mine is banked down. I'm very happy the way I'm paddling along. But uh, it was very difficult. Um, people, my, my school friends weren't bad, I must say. I was very lucky. Nobody knew what it was. I didn't know what it was. And I think when I started to learn about it and went to England to their association, and started educating myself, I thought, then I started sort of not embracing it, but accepting it. And I think acceptance, I, the more you stress about it and deny it and fight it, it gets worse, which is terrible. But mm -hmm. I think by educating yourself, getting the right treatment, getting a good dermatologist or whatever it is you find that works for you. But um, the amount of people that I talk to every year and they're, they're not getting the right, they're not going to the right doctors or not getting it. They might have never seen a dermatologist. Um, some people will have mild psoriasis. It'll flare up, it'll go away. Mine was just bad the whole time. So I think really educate yourself, get a good doctor advice and um, and follow what they tell you. And as you said earlier, Carmel, there's no point in a doctor prescribing cold tar treatment if you're out the door at eight o'clock in the morning or, you know, try and find what suits your lifestyle maybe concentrate on the scalp every weekend, do a couple of nights you're watching Carnation or whatever it is, and start applying the stuff. And it becomes a way of life. I mean, I never moisturized. I never knew about moisturizing. I was rubbing on steroid creams on top of big, thick black psoriasis. Sure, that was going nowhere. So, yeah. I mean, I was so ignorant for so many years. That's why I'm passionate about people getting educated, you know, and, and, and asking for the proper treatments for them, you know. I completely agree with what Caroline said there about, unfortunately, 
far too many people are diagnosed with psoriasis or even undiagnosed and not provided with the information that they need to be able to one cope with living with a chronic condition and two to just treat it effectively i mean i was diagnosed for five years after i was handed the booklet that actually happens to be Irish Skin's booklet that told me everything that I needed to know about treating my psoriasis and just read the book and said, okay, I'm going to try this way of treating my psoriasis. And straight away, I saw the amount of scale on my body decreased immediately. And I thought to myself, why wasn't I handed this five years ago? Because if I had been handed it, my psoriasis probably would have never got to as severe an extent as it was. So I agree there that it's information. And unfortunately, a lot of the time you have to go out and seek it yourself. So it's educating yourself. But there are such good resources out there that a lot of people don't know about. And I have to say that within Ireland, you know, there's probably a lot of sources, as you say, Caroline, on Dr. Google that aren't reputable. But within Ireland, Irish Skin has a fantastic resource that I don't think enough people know exists. So there's the free downloadable booklet from Irish Skin called, you know, it basically tells you everything you need to know from start to finish with psoriasis, including the emollients therapy. Because for me, it was discovering emollients therapy that completely changed the way that I treated my psoriasis. The very same as Caroline for years, I was putting on every prescribed lotion and potion I was given directly onto the scale and it wasn't having the desired effect it should have. And it's because no one told me about that step where you have to get rid of that top layer so that you can treat the, the red patches. So it's a case of if you feel like you have exhausted everything and you've tried every path, you might just not have been following the treatment regime the way that you should have been. And it's because no one told you how to do it right. So it could be a case of revisiting a treatment that you've already tried or trying a new one, but just looking at the routine more thoroughly and including those important steps. Thanks, uh, Zoe. It's funny that Caroline said, you know, that she covered up and Zoe, you said that you want to embrace it. I'm hoping that the stigma of psoriasis is lifting, but is there anything, you know, when choosing clothes, you said, Zoe, you wouldn't give up wearing black. So you have your little roly fluff um roller to remove the scale like is the colors that you wear is the patterns that you wear is there can you share any tips that if you are because even i don't know whether either of you wore dark school uniforms i can imagine i had a dark jumper if i had psoriasis as a teenager and my school uniform now I would be very conscious of it, I imagine. So is there any colours, patterns, any tips that you can give for people with bad scalp psoriasis that you use? Uh, first of all, I'd wear a lot of cotton. I, I try always and wear cotton as much as I can because it's more breathable. And, you, and I find I overheat and I don't know if everybody with psoriasis, I would get very warm much quicker than my husband who would be always cold. But I'd wear a lot of floral patterns and I still do to this day, even though my psoriasis is better. I did manage to buy shorts a couple of years ago and um, dresses and that. And as I say, I did buy my dark jackets and things like that. But I would think lighter, florally colored clothes, camouflage did an awful lot for me. I did have a dark uniform going to school, which didn't help, but I had no choice but to wear it. But yeah. um, I think and I couldn't wear white then either too much white because I would scratch my psoriasis, which would bleed, and I looked like someone shot me with a pellet gun sometimes, <laughs> um, you know, so I had to wear sort of pattern clothes, you didn't see things so much, and certainly cotton against your clothes, not lycra, and that sort of stuff uh, would drive me crazy, um, but, you know, light colour clothes, and I suppose with men, you could wear your light coloured pattern shirts that they have nowadays, maybe wear a lighter suit, um, you know, you can get khaki colours and different things like that, because I say it is it is difficult when you're in a, a corporate situation with with dark suits and things like that. Uh, mix and match and, and wear lighter cotton clothes particularly. For me with the psoriasis, I mean, I think it stems from many years of me kind of refusing to believe that, you know, I, it was incurable, but also from kind of having this kind of stance on it that I was going, I'm not going to let the psoriasis control my life and um, type of a thing. 
for me, I think it's more of when you have psoriasis, it's about compromise. It's about working with the condition, knowing what agitates it. Like Caroline said there, we're in the cotton because, you know, it's going to be more pleasant on the skin. But for me, I try not to restrict what I wear based on the psoriasis. I know for a lot of people that avoid wearing short sleeves and that avoid wearing short skirts or dresses because they don't want the psoriasis exposed. And that's why I said earlier that life will become a lot easier for you if you can get to that stage where you accept it you know because then you won't restrict yourself from wearing those things where the psoriasis is on show but there are days where you will not feel strong enough to do that and for me it's less about clothing choices and more about accessories so i would use a lot of kind of baseball caps and other type of headwear hats and you know hat accessories to cover the psoriasis on my scalp if it is very bad you know a lot of people like the silk kind of headbands and things where they can style their hair in that way and um, of course you can use different types of nice gloves as well to cover it on the hands as well as that hiding the psoriasis if that's what you want to do it's protecting your hands as well because especially in the cold months when the psoriasis is exposed you know in the, the cold air or even in the hot it, it's quite sore so wearing your gloves is going to give that extra protection and um, wearing scarves as well. I know that my dad loves wearing scarves around his neck because obviously um, with him having the shorter hair to try and hide the psoriasis at the, the nape of the neck, he'll put a nice silk scarf around his neck maybe with a suit. And um, so that could be an option for men that if you're worried about, you know, going into a corporate setting. And as you said earlier, Carmel, having the psoriasis sitting on your sleeve, just throw a nice kind of classy silk scarf over the, the kind of collar of the the suit that might protect it a bit but for me really as well I think the long hair comes in handy that I style my hair in a lot of ways that it covers the the psoriasis around um, my hair but for me and um, the accessories is how I go about it because as I said I'm not willing to compromise the black I just love black and wear it all the time so it, it is a nightmare that's why I need to have the little lint roller with me at all times but um yeah, if you don't want to give up certain clothes that you like wearing, accessories is a clever way to get around it. When you use the rollers, Zoe, just out of pure interest, do you go into the bathroom to use it or do you use it publicly? Or... OK, so um, <laughs> I have a larger roller at home and in the desk in work that I will use. Yeah. But no, look, I've gotten to the stage where oh, I remember sitting in conference rooms and you're just sitting there. You know, you could be even on a conference call with China and all your work colleagues around you and you see the pile on your shoulder and you do that really awkward, large swoop of the, the sleeve but you can never get it all so yeah if I'm in a setting like that in an office I won't but I do always have the foam little uh, the little mini ones in a handbag with me that if I'm on the likes of Dublin bus or any sort of public transport train or anything just pop it out of the bag I think I feel if you do anything with confidence you get away with it if you're going to be awkward and boosting around in the bag slowly trying to do it just take it out whip off the paper and do it quick and no one will question it but another handbag saver I always have with me when you mentioned about going to the bathroom you said earlier about a fine tooth comb which is of yeah. course used for when you're scraping out the psoriasis um but unfortunately you don't even have to be doing emollient therapy for the plaques to loosen themselves from your scalp and start traveling down your hair obviously with the very long hair then i'm going around and i've got half bits of psoriasis and your nails just can't pull out them little bits as well as the combs do so I've started putting a little fine tooth comb I find the little ones that are actually for head lice are the best because they're very fine with the teeth have one of them in your handbag and if it's a case of like look I'm definitely one that I'll be on public transport and I might be picking unknowns to myself you could be going out for dinner or heading into work and you get there and you go oh my god I have big lumps of psoriasis in my hair what am I going to do I know I'm not going to be able to get them out so take out your comb pop into the bathroom and just comb out the plaques and for me that gets rid of some of the self-consciousness because that would have been also the thing that when I was traveling somewhere having the like psoriasis plaques on your coat or having the bits coming through your hair and you only see them when you get to the restaurant so having the little comb in the bag take it out and just uh, you know scrape them out then you're not going to be self-conscious for the entire meal or wherever you're heading to that's great thank you uh, we might just look in the question and answers box and see uh what's there 
Um, is there any dietary advice? Now, psoriasis and diet, there has been nothing to prove um, that, that diet is linked to, to psoriasis. Psoriasis has a genetic predisposition, so it's an inherited disease. And I know, Zoe, your dad has psoriasis. I think, Caroline, you have family members, is that correct, with psoriasis? Yeah. Yeah. So it yeah. is, it's, it's a genetic thing, unfortunately, and we can't control our genes. So no, diet doesn't play an effect uh, with psoriasis. Um, it's Caroline or Zoe, anything to add on that? Um, I, for years I've asked that same question. I know there's been no lot of research, but yeah, I, I certainly found certain foodstuffs could flare it. Like uh, I lived abroad for years and ate absolute wads of cheese and I was hospitalized twice in seven years. I, I think dairy, too much dairy or yeast bread would pink it up a bit. It would flare it certainly. Um, and I try and avoid that. Um, it was, uh, and uh, there's a question there as well about hormones. Can hormones affect it? Every month when I used to get a period, um, it would absolutely drive it loopy for a couple of days. Uh, so hormones can drive it. Um, but I just found, I think people have to sort of maybe keep a food diary and see, is, you know, what's flaring it. But I certainly think yeast, and they, they do say beer. Um, experts have, doctors agree that beer can flare it. And I think there's a lot of yeast in that. That's just my personal feel on it now. As psoriasis is autoimmune, it kind of, everybody shows, like everyone will have different triggers <coughs> with it. You know, like as Carmen said earlier that, you know, it's not one thing will work for everybody because it's autoimmune, your psoriasis will react differently to different treatments and et cetera. But it's the same with food that obviously there's no, definite answer on it as you said caramel you know it's not been proven that there is a link with the food and that would be from the western medical side when i'm treating my psoriasis i like to take a blended approach to treating it so taking information from different schools of thought so for instance in chinese herbal medicine they believe that there is a link with diet and whenever i'm looking at the alternative or the holistic type of medicines and treatments for psoriasis I like to take snippets from it that make sense to me. So when someone said to me, you know, there's certain food groups that might flare it up, but it's different for everybody. It's really a case of just finding your own triggers. For me, it's a case of, we know psoriasis is an inflammatory condition. I find if I eat foods that are very high in spices, content that would have a lot of heat in them, that my psoriasis seems to get worse. And I suppose that's got to do with the link between it being an inflammatory condition, but you know, I'm not saying that that's scientifically proven, just personally for me. I don't have any issue with dairy, whereas Caroline said she has. So that just has proved to people that it's very specific to the person that your psoriasis will have things it likes and dislikes. And as Caroline gave the advice there of keeping a diary and writing down, you know, maybe the foods you ate today, the different kind of conditions you were in, whether it was hot weather, cool weather, what type of clothing you wore today, what type of detergents or products you were using on your skin. That's the only way you're going to be able to identify what your triggers are and what your psoriasis dislikes and likes are. And from that, then you can work with your condition to kind of, you know, incorporate things into your daily routine that it reacts well to. Um, there's another question here, and maybe because the two of you have experienced the symptoms, both Zoe and Caroline, how is it that sometimes the itch is uncontrollable and sometimes my scales are very itchy and in company and at work is just difficult? Do either of you experience that? Now, what I would be thinking is probably in hot situations or stressful situations that the blood vessels dilate and that the heat of the skin contributes to the itch or maybe the dryness. Have either of you experienced or got any tips on that? Well, all the time when my plaques rise would be bad because your skin is shedding and coming to the fore and I used to moisturize, it used to be itchy and itchy and itchy and I'd scratch it until I bleed. 
and and it's a lot better now obviously than on the biologic but yeah i think moisturizing is the key you have some in your handbag through the day and go into the loo at lunchtime or whatever but i think moisturizing is 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 key because it, it, it's 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 lost in the medical dictionaries and you probably know this caramel that it's it's not seen as an itchy condition i don't know yeah. where they came up with that oh my god it's the itchiest thing i've ever <laughs> seen you know yeah i think moisturizing hugely and and when i would go to a hotel or if i was at a conference and the heat in the hotel room i'd always turn off the radiator i'd have a window open i just have to keep cool it just over you overheat i suppose because the pores of your skin are all open when you have a bad attack um it's just you're losing the heat out of out of your body but you feel very hot all the time yeah i would yes. agree with caroline there that it's got to do with everyone's triggers are different. Like I would be the same as Caroline that when I'm in a foreign country or somewhere that's very hot, my skin feels like it's absolutely crawling. But I know that for some people being in hotter climates actually helps and it's cold weather that will have that effect for them. So yet again, it's very specific to the person. But in regards to that person asking why is sometimes the itch uncontrollable? For me, it's got to do with products and the ingredients in them. So I find that certain shampoos, um, I won't even notice until I get out of the shower and I've actually dried my hair, that my scalp will feel like it's crawling. So that's obviously got to do with the ingredients that are in the shampoos. <coughs> I know that my dad would have the same with the psoriasis on his hands. He feels when he uses certain hand washes or certain creams on his hands, he'll get that uncontrollable itch. So I do think that it's very much related to either the climate that you're in, as Caroline said, or perhaps the ingredients or even, you know, the fabrics that are touching against your skin. Yeah. Just another one here, and this is probably applicable to one of the mousses that you use, uh, Zoe. I have recently started using the urea on my scalp and have found great relief from it, but can I use it long term? And um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Zoe. Sorry, <laughs> you're the one with the actual medical um, degree here. Um, I Like any product that I use, I also extensively research it and I have been assured because from years of using the steroids, which obviously you can only use for a certain amount of times and in small amounts, I was very particular when I was using the U Life or the Real Life range, um, which contains urea. Um, there's nothing in urea so to speak you know our body actually naturally creates it and it's just that people with psoriasis we you know if we have a deficiency in it so that's why the urea helps there but there's nothing in it it'll either moisturize your skin or um as you said it'll have that peeling effect but as far as i know you can use it as frequently throughout the day as you want and it's, it's not going to have any bad side effects it's not like a steroid we're using too much of it can have undesirable side effects I also just see that um, someone has asked about if you don't have a handbag, uh, what to do about <laughs> home. I do apologise um, to that person. Um, I was just thinking of myself. My dad actually does also carry one of those small combs in his back or front pocket in his jeans. So they're very thin, like you can see from them. They're, they're like a little sheet of paper. And he actually has a smaller one than this. His is only about half the size and he just pops it even in his wallet sometimes, depending on what pants he's wearing. So they are very accessible to be slid into a, a pocket of a pants or into a wallet if you carry one. Very good. Um, there's another question here. Please explain what vi vitamin D analog is. So with psoriasis, your cell turnover is a lot faster than normal. So the cell turnover in psoriasis is every three to four days, whereas in normal skin, it's roughly every 28 days. So the vitamin D analog helps to slow down that process the vitamin D analog does not contain any steroid. So it's, it's in product, the vitamin D analog is products like Jovenex, Calcipatriol, and these are prescribed treatments that you can use without the worrying side effects of steroids. Have either of you, Zoe or Caroline, used the Dovinex or? Yeah, I found, I found it very good. 
for right. the short term and, and uh, but I think the mistake people may they use it and they see their scalp clearing up and then they stop and obviously you're going to have a rebound you know your skin needs it and just wean yourself off it I suppose like everything else yeah, like I think that the key to treating psoriasis and maintaining it is the problem that a lot of people see is that once you use it, it's nearly like they think it's a once all treatment that, you know, if they can clear it, the, the skin, they're going, oh, I'm cured and it's not going to come back. Whereas, unfortunately, it has to be maintained. My recommendations to people would be repetition and routine. If you find something that works for you, you have to keep doing it. I know it's annoying, but if you stop the scale will be back like absolute lightning. And um, so if you're using your emollient and then maybe putting on your prescribed treatment, if you find that's working and after a couple of weeks, it's it's almost clear, don't stop because that's it's like when people take antibiotics and they stop taking it before the end of the course. There's no point in taking it in the first place. It has to be maintained. You have to keep doing it. So try and get yourself into a routine that it's not a big chore, that you know you incorporate it into some part of your team. Like Carmel actually gave me great advice before of saying that one of the best times to apply your emollient is after a shower. And I think that if you get yourself into that kind of a routine or that habit that you hop out of the shower, dab yourself down and put on your emollient all over it's a really quick way to get that emollient fit into your regime that it's not like an extra thing that after doing a long day shift and work and you want to watch to tell you you're going oh, I'm going to have to strip down and put my emollient on do it at a time like that that will suit you and then it'll just be part of your routine it won't be an extra step that's going to be an effort for you um there's another question here. I had scalp psoriasis as a child, but then it disappeared for over 40 years and now it's back with a vengeance. Uh, the past two weeks, now the past two weeks have developed it all over my body and I have no idea what triggered it. Is this a common thing that it can disappear for years and suddenly return? So psoriasis, you can go through remissions and relapses. So unfortunately, yes, you know, you can be good for a long, long time. And then frequently there will be a trigger, whether it was a stressful event in your life, you know, maybe a bereavement, you may have had an infection. Um, and then sometimes because it is a genetic predisposition, it just flares and you really don't know why the flare occurred. Um, the thing is to go to your GP now and to start the appropriate treatment and even just to make your skin a bit more comfortable by using the emollients. And if you want to contact the helpline and get advice from one of the nurse specialists, they'd be happy to talk you through uh, you know, a regime until you get prescribed treatment from a doctor. I see a, a question for you there as well, Zoe. Zoe mentioned the psoriasis community online. How does one connect with them as that would be great? Um, yeah, I find that the best pages are on Instagram, but if you're not on Instagram, there is some pages on Facebook. I know that there's some even groups on Facebook where it would be maybe members of the psoriasis community that they maybe have like a chat that they can speak in. So if you look for them on Facebook, but personally, um, I just like what looking at other people's pages and reading their advice and of course seeing them kind of be so embracing and as I said kind of inspiring about um, their skin so Instagram I find is the best place for that I think to access Instagram you might need to have an account but you could always set up an account that even if you don't want to be active on it uh, just so that you can access other people's there's also a lot of not maybe YouTubers so to say but people who would have a channel like myself and um, where they would give tips and helpful information about treating your psoriasis and about their experiences with psoriasis so youtube instagram facebook um twitter not so much i also have an, a twitter account but um for me instagram is is where it's at where you really get that kind of sense of feeling of community thank you um i think we'll be wrapping up now we've answered uh, most of the questions i'd like to give 
a last message to people and then I'm going to ask Caroline and Zoe to give a last message. So from the nursing perspective, if you are under the care of a healthcare professional, please be honest and speak honestly. Um, when you go to your appointments, don't say I'm grand. I oh, am yeah, fine because we don't know then the help that you need. If your scalp is bad, please say it's bad. You know, at least then we can help you. And just, you know, go to your pharmacy. They're very good as well at giving advice. So reach out to people. And when you go to the hairdressers, do not be afraid to go to the hairdressers. All hairdressers at this stage are familiar with psoriasis. It's not... Um, it's not an experience that you should be dreading, really. And just if you're going to a new hairdresser's, explain it's psoriasis, it's not contagious, but 99.9% .9 of them will know what it is. So, Caroline, would you like to give your final message and then we'll ask Zoe for her final message for people? Yeah, um, get yourself educated, get good medical websites. Um, contact the Skin Foundation and get your information. Find yourself a good doctor or dermatologist and, and pour your heart out to them. Tell them how distressed you are and be honest. Um, cry always works really well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it usually gets their attention. Um, but no, try and get the proper treatment and follow. Don't just go home with the tube of cream and then wonder when you get home what you do with it. Um, <laughs> don't do what I did for 30 years, you know, make a lot of mistakes um get the right help and the, there is help out there and it's not contagious and it's 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 a bit like a, the puppies at christmas it's not just for christmas it's for life basically i would say persevere i know that as someone who was treating it for for my whole life there are times and there are days where you'll want to give up and you'll say i can't do it anymore i can't try another treatment and undergo another treatment and to see it fail and not work there's a reason why it's not working and it's because it's not suited to either you or your type of psoriasis and there will be a treatment out there that you'll stumble upon or it mightn't even be one treatment it could be a combination of different treatments that that particular combination will work for you so i know how hard it is to keep going but if you feel like you've exhausted everything they are constantly creating new treatments and new products that are improved that are more easy to apply and more pleasant to undergo if it's a case of as you said earlier carmel you could have tried a tar years ago hated it said it's destroying my bed sheets the smell of it around the house i don't want to do it there are a lot of treatments out there now and as i said it's ongoing that you might find or sorry you will find one that will work for you it's just a case of trial and error unfortunately with psoriasis because it's autoimmune they can't say if you try this, it will work because it worked for some other person because everybody reacts differently. So keep on going and um, go back to your doctor. My advice would be as well, if you're not happy with your doctor and you don't feel like you're being heard or listened to, find yourself another doctor because there is a doctor out there that you will feel like you're able to talk to them. You don't want to go in there and feel like you can't ask questions or that you're not being heard. So keep looking for someone who's going to make you feel like you're heard and is going to work with you to find a treatment plan and routine that works for you. And just one final thing here, there's um, somebody that is looking for over-the-counter preparations that will just help to reduce the scale while they're waiting to see a dermatologist. So do either of you want to share what works for you? Um, what I found um, double base emollient gel really good. I've tried every moisturizer over the years and all the usuals and some of them were just too watery. I needed something thick and I found that putting it on at night, you're, you'd still feel it on your skin the next day. That worked really well for me. Uh, for and what you, sorry. And what do you use in the shower, Caroline? Well, nowadays, because I'm 99% clear of psoriasis on plaques, I just use normal shower. Um, okay. I, I, my treatment when I was nine was, was coal tar. And to this day, when I smell it, I could cry. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't bear it because that's yeah. all I had for years as, as a child. Even when they're tearing the road in the summer, I could cry when I smell it. But that's uh -huh. okay. It's a great treatment. It really does work. 
but it's just um it's, it was very not cosmetic at, at that time but um yeah that would do and, and i think for the scalp um some of the mousses i suppose but now i, I use normal shampoos and conditioners really um doesn't seem to make much of a difference because i have very little left on me now mm. Sorry, Zoe, I interrupted you there as well. Um, I was going to say that for the scalp, for me, um, the one that I see really has the biggest impact is coconut oil. And a step that you can't leave out is the, the gently scraping out the, the scales after leaving it in for a certain period of time. I like to leave it in overnight to let it marinate. But for years, I was putting in all these different kind of oils, even the coconut oil on my scalp. And because I wasn't doing that gentle brushing off of the scales, I may as well not have been going around with coconut oil in my hair for a couple of days. And um, you really have to use that step. But uh, Caroline's gone through the ones that work best on the body. But for me, it was finding the scalp one. And um, so coconut oil really does break through those plaques quite well. To be honest with you, if you're doing the steps of the emollient treatment properly, like leaving it in for a certain amount of time, scraping it out and washing it out, I have found most emollients to be effective. But I just find if you're having a particularly thick plaque, the coconut oil is the one to go with. Great. So I think we've come to an end now of this webinar and I'd really like to thank Caroline and Zoe for being on the panel this evening and for being so honest and for sharing their experiences. I hope that we have helped people and given them good advice. And I would encourage anybody that wants further information or further advice to um, contact the Ask a Nurse helpline because the nurses are super. They'll give you great advice and tips. You know, they're looking after people with psoriasis from day to day. So they're there to help.